lesbians love you. Thank you. Lesbians, lesbians love you. And well, I love you. Um, Lauren, who uh, Stacy mentioned, her uh, campaign manager, now CEO, CEO of Fairfy, is also a lesbian. Mm -hmm. We will claim her, we will take her. Yes. Um, which makes you lesbian adjacent. It lesbian adjacent. Lesbian exactly. adjacent. There you go. Right there, that's how it happens. So, I didn't, I didn't see you playing basketball. <laughs> you won't. <laughs> And I've been trying to get I, Paris I Fisher to do that hula hoop contest for five years, and Oop. I will keep trying, but it's probably never going to happen. All right, so we start off everything with a high five. You ready? Hold it. You know, we got to do that branding. we got to do that branding. Okay. So you talk about how geeky you are. Yes. I want to know what the most geeky thing is about you. A, we don't have that kind of time. <laughs> um, <laughs> Look, I, I watch an inordinate <laughs> amount of, so I love television at large, but I am very much into science fiction. Um, I, was, I was briefly a physics major, but uh, I got to differential calculus and I was like, nah, never mind. <laughs> I'll, I'll watch Star Trek. But, so some of you may know that my preparation for the State of the Union rebuttal was watching approximately three hours of Doctor Who season seven. You think that's the geekiest thing about you? No, that's all I'm gonna tell you though. <laughs> all right, we're gonna keep trying. Well, so I got to meet President Rosalind from Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> and I've met Captain Janeway. <laughs> Just when lesbians you tech thought they couldn't love you more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in tech, it's really, you know, it's a common thing to have a side hustle. Mm -hmm. Many people have side hustles. You've had a side hustle. Um, when you were at Yale Law School, uh, you wrote romance novels, but really it was a sci-fi book that, in order to get published, you turned into a romance novel? So it was a spy novel. It was a spy novel. Yes. Well, I mean, maybe we could do the science fiction. It, well, it was based on microzeolite technology, which sounds science fiction. I mean, that's it basically was, same, same. So yeah, so my ex-boyfriend was a chemical physicist, and I was like one of three people who read his dissertation. Um, <laughs> Sometimes you gotta take one for the team. Look. Someone's gotta do it. And he had this technology called, he had studied this technology called microzeolites, and I was like, ooh, you could take these microzeolites and you could clean the environment, and if it fell into the wrong hands, it could be a chemical weapon because deployment, oh, I, the CIA you know, We gets, love this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so the, the idea was that you know, chemical weapons are localized, and if you want it wide disbursement, it's hard, and microzeolites can hold other chemicals without reacting. And so I got really excited, and he was like, you can't do any of those things. I'm like, this is why we broke up, because you have no imagination. <laughs> Um, and so I wrote a romance novel, so I tried to write it as a spy novel, but publishers in the 90s didn't think that black women could publish spy novels. They didn't think women could publish spy novels. So I just made my spies fall in love. I killed the same number of people, and the ones who survived <laughs> got to fall in love, and I put my ex-boyfriend into prison, and where he languishes to this day. So um, I was, I'm sure we were running, do you have any more side hustles or ideas of side hustles that you'd like to, maybe we can narrow down the list so together? I wrote eight romantic suspense novels from 2000 until 2010. I have started three small businesses, uh, one of which was a tech company that is still kind of trying to find its way. Um, we, we could tell. I figure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, we could talk about yeah, it. I, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. I got you, I got you. Uh, and... You know, I have this, this pesky political thing I try to do, which right now is very much a side hustle, so. <laughs> That's the thing with side hustles. Sometimes they become your main there hustle, you and they go back, and it's sort of. That's the plan. Round and round. That's the plan. So, technologists, as you are, love to solve tough problems. What do you think is the toughest problem facing our democracy today, our country today? Voter suppression. Voter suppression. <laughs> But, but, but here's the technology piece of it. Voter suppression works by convincing people either in practice or through sort of a psychic sense that they're, they don't count. And part of what technology is designed to do is break barriers. And what I think we could demonstrate if we figure this out is, you know, the act of voting is simply the manifestation of your visibility as a citizen. 
It is the moment you get to put your voice into the mix. And what voter suppression is designed to do is to silence those voices, to say that there are people who do not count, that there are ideas that should not be heard, and that there are people we do not value. And so when I talk about voter suppression, it's not simply the act of voting, it is the act of participation in our body politic. And when you tell people they don't count, they believe you. And if we do not solve that problem, then we are going to see the fastest growing parts of our nation grow silent. And the people who are loudest right now, we do not want those people to be the only ones we hear. You've actually been working on voter suppression for a long time. Yes. Many people think with just the recent election that this is an issue that obviously you wanted to take on, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the beginning of when you decided to take on this issue. So I'm the daughter of Methodist ministers, but before they were ministers, my mom and dad were civil rights activists. My dad was arrested when he was 16, registering people to vote in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And I was raised watching my parents go and vote and they would explain to us that they voted, even if none of our neighbors did, they voted because they knew it mattered, that they knew that's how they made their voices heard. Uh, so in college, I registered voters throughout my um, college and in the neighborhoods. I did civic engagement work. I got to go to Salzburg, Austria. I was like the only black person there. Um, <laughs> ever, <seriously>. ever, <laughs> yeah, probably ever. It, it was an interesting group of people to be with. Uh, and then I did this thing, I went to this march on Washington thing yep. uh, in 93, uh, mm -hmm. uh, talked about voter suppression there. Uh, thank you. You are really kind. I know. They're going to leave with you, I think, after. They're I, like, I think they're just like heading. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but for me, voter suppression, it, it, it's, it's, it's the yin and the yang, because the antidote to voter suppression is voter engagement. And so the work I've done as a student activist, as a politician, uh, the work that I do in almost every space I'm in is designed to increase access to the right to vote. Voter registration, we started the New Georgia Project, which since 2014 has registered more than 300,000 people of color in Georgia. Uh, the work we're doing with Fair Fight. For me, this is longitudinal. You, you have to constantly be engaged in this conversation because the policies we care about live in the practice of voting. Do you think we'll ever get to online voting? I don't know. I, I think that the challenge there is that people are corrupt and they will try to steal your voice. And so until we have a technology that is impenetrable and invulnerable, online voting is gonna be hard. Even though it might be more accessible? The accessibility is fantastic, but the vulnerability is too, means you it think can it's be manipulated. Outweighs. And you've got to remember that the communities that are the most vulnerable are the ones that have the least amount of agency. And so even while it, it may increase accessibility writ large, if you're in a community that has very limited access to the internet and you've got one provider, that one provider gets corrupted, suddenly you have entire communities who are not only silenced, they're now pawns for someone else's voice. Right. Well, and the reality is you can hack anything, anything. if you have enough money, and exactly. if the other side has more money than the people you're trying to get exactly. access to, then it's a hard problem to solve that way. I mean, so I'd like us to figure out how we can use paper well, so, you know. <laughs> Again, low, uh, low bar. really low. Low bar. This is a little bit of a tangent, but you know if you go on an airplane, and they be, they're printing out the like, you know, holes in the paper thing. And I'm like, how are we on this airplane? <laughs> and they're still printing out the you little things. I'm like, haven't we had the technology, y'all? Like, you just, just need like, to not think about certain things too hard. I know, it's, it's really, it's fine, it's gonna be okay. Um, I love I'm about to get on a plane. Yeah, so no, it's gonna, be great. it's gonna be great. <laughs> um, so I asked uh, Hillary Clinton the same question, but I think it's really important, I'm really, no pressure. Um, I think it's, I'm really curious to hear your answer, but if you were tech CEO tomorrow, how would you solve the diversity and technology problem? I would hire diverse people. <laughs> but, right? But, but I can bring receipts. I mean, we ran the most, <laughs> we ran the most diverse campaign in Georgia history. We had every community represented. Uh, there was one star, there was an article that called us the gayest campaign in Georgia history. Um, <laughs> But it, it, we had every religious group, every, or most of the major religious groups, we had every ethnicity, we had age,
But part of it is that you have to create space for people to not be great if you want to get diversity. And, and I mean it this way. It's not that you have to hire inferior people, but you have to hire people who can learn how to do their jobs. And if you have to be perfect... It takes a resilience and a patience to build diversity because often the person or the company that, that increases diversity does so by creating the space for those people to first enter. Absolutely. And what we did in our campaign, and it was difficult because we had some folks who really learned on the job and they made lots of mistakes on the job. And so you have to be willing to adapt to that. And, and I've been working on this. I mean, in politics, we, we have a diversity issue too. And so I was intentional about hiring people long before they knew what they were doing so they could be trained to do this work. And over time, we were able to create an incredibly diverse team that learned skills and they were then able to replicate themselves because when you have diversity in your hires, your hi the team that, knew, that now hires also increases diversity. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that you become diverse when you open the door. And that's how I'd solve it. Yeah. It's a network thing. One of the things um, Arlen Hamilton says often is that I want to give founders a chance to fail. Yes. Right? I mean, that's how we learn. You talk about in Silicon Absolutely. Valley, you're failing fast, and there's so much learning from failure, but you know, for a lot of underrepresented founders, they don't even have the chance to fail, and that's exactly. how we learn and gain access to power. Um, so if you could pass, besides let's outside of voter-related mm -hmm. issues, if you could pass one piece of legislation tomorrow, what would you pass? I would revise the tax code. And, and here's that. She's also an accountant, so it's yeah. multiple side hustles. So I'm a tax attorney by training. Our tax code is designed for wealthy white men. Everyone else is an afterthought. If you want to fix income inequality, you address the payroll tax. You recognize that we should not have a cap on the payroll tax. You should have a floor. Um, and you remove the penalties that are embedded against women, against parents, against people of color, against anyone in a low-wage job. Uh, the tax code, I used to, anyone who would come to my uh, community meetings as a state legislator had to spend the first 15 minutes listening to me talk about taxes. <laughs> because here's, what, here's the thing. We spend a lot of time talking about appropriations, how we spend money. But if you want to know how a government plans to spend money, look at where they get it. The people they tax are the ones they are least concerned about. And if you want to understand the priorities of a community, look at who's taxed and look at who gets away with it. And so I wanted my folks to understand, you should be really, you shouldn't be sitting in appropriations. We'll come to those meetings too, but come to Ways and Means because where you get your money determines how you plan to spend your money. And that's the, that's the, land, the place I would start. So we're gonna do we're gonna do a little rapid fire, okay? And then we're actually gonna open up to audience questions. So get ready, start thinking of your questions. Are you team dog or cat? I am team book. <laughs> I don't own a pet. Had, <laughs> if you had to choose only one, look at you. You don't like animals at all. I, if, I don't dislike them. That sounds like an active verb. I don't dislike animals. I just, I respect them enough to own them. <laughs> I respect them too much to own them. I'm good. They leave me alone. I leave them alone. We're all set. So you have a lot of plants. No, because no I will kill them. Okay. No. I am team book. Books team don't book. die. Book. All right. They, they come alive when you open them. They, they don't make any noise when you close them. They are awesome. You are really... <laughs> Really, really living up to the geek. Yes. It's really, uh, it's coming through. Do you own Bitcoin? I do not. If you have, Is that a mistake? I mean, I'm just, you know, it's good to know. I mean, you've got, you've got a face. You know, I mean, I just, okay. I have something, something to talk about. Okay. Um, if you had to be a CEO of a tech company tomorrow, which company would it be? Google. Because, control, I'm a geek, but also if you control information, you can control dict the universe. You control the world. The world. I mean, imagine a politician who controls Google. I mean, come on. I mean, Ooh. but I mean, but think about it. When people come to ask questions, the information you can provide 
the way you can help shape their thinking? Yes, I don't Google. And use all my money to I mean, buy I'd stock be okay and with that. If we can, I maybe Kara can make that happen. Um, favorite sci-fi author? Octavia Butler. <laughs> also a lesbian? President or senator? Of what? <laughs> it's an either or question, <laughs> Stacey. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> That's fair. She's also a politician. She knows how yeah. to get out of the question. <laughs> Do you think Facebook is a utility? <laughs> so when you ask the question, I think about it as a politician, mm -hmm. which means should it be regulated? And also should it be taxed? And, <laughs> how, and, and so for that reason, I think there are functionalities that are absolutely a utility. Uh, I do not necessarily know what the utility sh structure, structure and scheme should be, um, but I think that there needs to be more than we are currently doing. Favorite female character on TV? Current or ever? Ever. I love Captain Janeway. So my last question, um, I talk a lot about having a North Star. My North Star, um, the thing that if it happened, I'd feel like all is right in the world, is having a black lesbian president. Mm -hmm. And I would love to know what your North Star is. Having a black woman president from the South. <laughs> Someone who's been at Lesbian Suit Tech? Someone who believes and respects all people and watches a lot of television. <laughs> all right. This is your time, audience. What do you want to ask Stacey Abrams? And I'm not going to tell you what I'm running for next. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't see you, so can someone else pick? Right here. Oscar, you pick. Give it up for Oscar on our team right here. Hello, my name is Juliana. I am recently, I've recently started a project called The Voter Deck, and it's uh, mission is to increase voter engagement. And so my question to you is, um, as we think about what, how to strategize and what to prioritize and essentially create our uh, MVP, I wanted to know what your advice was. Voters need to know what, what's in it for them. Voting by itself is not a sufficient rationale for voting because it seems distant and esoteric and unrelated to the, their daily struggles. The people you need to engage need to understand why it matters for them. So I go granular. People need to know it's about whether your kid gets to go to a school that's well-resourced. It's about whether the trash gets picked up on your street every week or not. So the best way to create voter engagement is to make sure you're connecting the dots between a vote and the lived experiences of those you're talking to. And it doesn't have to be complicated. Most people have no idea how government works, including people in it. <laughs> so, so finding ways to connect the dots and make it real, because telling people they should vote because people died for that right is not sufficient. It makes them feel bad if they don't. It doesn't make them do so. But they vote when they know that something's at stake and they stand to lose something if they don't do it. Have you heard of vote.org? Yeah? Still the mic? Maybe, maybe not. Anyways, vote.org, Deborah Cleaver is the founder, also a lesbian. Amazing. Look that up if you haven't already. This is like a really dark pr uh, Price is Right. <laughs> I trust Oscar. We're fine. Thank you. Great, great teamwork here. Uh, <laughs> Um, good afternoon, my name is Seven Zile. I am from South Africa. I'm, on, I'm here on a Fulbright uh, Fellowship. Yay! Hey. Yay. So, so uh, um, 
Ms. Abrams, if we could get your thoughts. I mean, Africa is, is an exciting place, right? We are a 1.2 billion population. Almost 60% of our population are under the age of 24 years old. Mm -hmm. We are urbanizing rapidly. In about three decades, we will have the largest population globally. So the future is African, and this goes for all investments. And, um, but, but in terms of, uh, of, of, of leadership in general, we have our issues literally across all 54 countries. What are some of your thoughts about what young people, like myself, can do to, well, not, not have to wait 30 years or so, and, you know, until we're in our 50s to, to take lead, but how can we start doing so now? Because the people will be leading by the time, you know, I'm in my 40s or 50s are going to be teenagers, and that's what we have right now. So how can we start thinking about it? Because ultimately, it is a long-term game. Absolutely. I, I think, first of all, thank you for the, the question. And for the, the context, I mean, we need to understand you know, the continent of Africa is twice the size of what we've been taught to think of it as. It is massive, and the capacity that is lost because of how colonization has trained American minds to think about Africa is an abomination. And so... And, and we know China understands this because China's putting a lot of money into building infrastructure throughout the continent of Africa. What I would say to young people is that sometimes it's not about starting at the top, it's starting at the bottom. It is the capacity to organize community that changes the future of politics. When you are aligned, and then this is not to diminish the very real threat of civil war, of tribalism, of the issues that have been fomented by colonization, and by creating a resource war that can never be won. But what can be won is encouraging young people to take control of the lowest levels of government, the most simplistic parts, and where they cannot, creating their own you know, super straits of government. Being able to, because government's just about cooperation. It's about how do you cooperate to increase the benefit to your community in a way that enlarges and embraces what's possible. And so I, I that's kind of what I did as minority leader in a different way. Like we had no power, we had very few resources, but we were trouble. <laughs> because we were united with a common purpose and we found different ways to engage and enlarge our voice. And so I think it's that. I think it's starting very small, but being many. And thinking about how do you recreate what fundamentals are engaged in the notion of government. And that is serving the people, providing resources, solving problems, and bringing communal power to foment change. And you should run for president of whatever of yes. South Africa. Yes. Hello, my name is uh, Lauren Swanson. I work at a company called Splunk. We're <laughs> Woo! There's a couple of us in the audience. Um, we're a sponsor of Lesbians Who Tech, and um, we are, have a huge initiative um, to create diversity and inclusion in our company. Um, and I was just, I literally just got off a plane this morning from our sales kickoff, and the room was full of white cis men. Um, and there was a small panel for allies and how to become an ally, um, but how do you, and it probably applies to government as well, how do you get people on board who don't even think about asking the question, what can I do? I, I, I believe in demonstration projects. I mean, part of the problem is when you're waiting for people to change, you're gonna be waiting a long time. And so my approach is you create the change and you apologize later if you need to apologize. But that goes back to what I was saying earlier. We didn't just talk about diversity in our campaign. We created it. And people wrote stories. They were very concerned about lots of things about our campaign, talking to communities of color, talking about them, but also having people no one recognized. We weren't hiring the consultants and the, the standard bearers that people were used to being, seeing hired. But we did that intentionally because we wanted diversity. We wanted new thought and new ideas. And so part of the challenge for allies is allies know the language to use. They don't know how to do it because people are inherently risk averse. 
diversity requires risk tolerance. And so the opportunity to push back, if you're talking to your sales force, if you want to sell to other people, you need people who have cultural competency to make those sales. And so you, it's tying it back to the bottom line of whatever that community needs. If it's about sales, making sure that the allies understand that they will increase their profit if they increase their diversity. Moral core does not yield lots of change. Avarice does. <laughs> Avarice works. <laughs> and so I would focus on how do you, so one, do it yourself, but if you can't do it yourself, make sure people have an incentive to do it and that there's pain for not doing it. Because that's the other thing. People get away with not, not engaging in diversity and inclusion because there's no cost to it. Make it hard, make it painful. Make them want to shut you up because you talk about it too much. You can, um, you can also bring all those white, straight, cis men to lesbians who tack next year. Yes. And, you know, I think, not all, not all of them. <laughs> I'm always like, once we get to 20% men, we'll have a conversation. But um, I think to your risk-taking point, I think, you know, oftentimes diversity isn't as risky as it feels, but because we are so, we're comfortable with people who look like us and who have our same experience, so it feels like a risk when we're hiring um, people that don't have things in common with us. And I think that's the big thing that we have to be aware of. Absolutely. But just keep per positive persistence, keep on them, um, and they will, they will listen to that. I'll go and talk to them too if you want. <laughs> Maybe two more questions, two more. Ooh, I like this. Use your voice. Hi, my name is Ruth. First, I want to just say thank you so much for what you're doing. And I was actually in D.C. in 93. And I'm very proud of you. And I'm very encouraged by what you've done and accomplished. And so my question is simply this. There's people here from all over the world. What can we do to best support and help what you're trying to move forward? Thank you. America is one of the most perfect examples of what democracy can do. And we are in crisis right now. And there are those who talk about voter fraud like it's real. It is not. It is a myth. It is so irregular as to be like getting struck by lightning. Yeah, that happened, but you've never met anybody. <laughs> voter suppression happens in every election. It happens in every state. It happens in California. It happens across the country. I need you all to talk about voter suppression all the time. You know, I was recently at an event, I'm like, we need to talk about voter suppression the way we talk about the Kardashians. Yeah. Yeah. I don't a lot, but you know, that, that's the best cultural reference I can use. Um, <laughs> but we need to talk about it with such rapidity and such insistence that people have to respond. Voter suppression works because we see it as normal. We get used to people not being able to go to their polling place. We, oh yeah, it might be a mistake that they made. We make voter suppression a personal failure of the person who couldn't vote, as opposed to a systemic failure of those who are paid to make it work. And you can go to fairfightaction.com and sign up. All right, the person in the back who was yelling the loudest. I got, are you ready? You, you got a mic? Hi, Ms. Abrams. Um, Hi. Thank you so much for being here. My question is a little bit less political and more personal. Sure. What's, um, your, what's your name? Where are you from? I'm Katie. I'm from the University of Oklahoma. Woo! Um, yeah, and so I'm a college student. Um, mm -hmm. And right now, it feels like I'm very good at being rejected from things. Yes. You talked about staying angry, but making your anger actionable. So what is your advice for the rest of us who are trying to stay angry, but make it actionable? Okay, so I, I really am doing this because I think it will help. I have this book that's coming out. Um, <laughs> so it, it came out last year in the middle of my campaign, and I'm the only politician in human history who couldn't promote her book because it was, I was accused of illegal campaign contributions. It, it was, yeah, no other politician has ever written a book before. Anyway, <laughs> but 
it's being re-released as Lead from the Outside. It comes out at the end of the month. Um, but here's the thing. The book is about failure. It's about being rejected. I tell a story about how I applied for a scholarship where I was, you know, I was certain if I got through this hard part, it was gold. And I lost big. And it could have crushed me. And in fact, I decided not to go to Harvard because I thought I wasn't smart enough because I didn't get this scholarship. Uh, I eventually figured out I was being an idiot and I ended up going to Yale, so I was good. But, <laughs> but it took a year and it, it, it was really, it, it did a number on me. And in this book, I talk not only about being rejected, but I talk about how you turn those mistakes into action. And the reason I, I mentioned the book is because I have exercises in there, because it's great to give people advice, but advice is only helpful if you can remember all the things that people said. I actually give you exercises and work to do. And the most important thing to do with rejection is to understand why it happened. You have to investigate how much of it is you, how much of it is them, how much of it is systemic, and what parts can you fix. I spent a lot of time after this campaign trying to figure out what could I have done differently. And there are a few times I probably could have phrased things differently, but we didn't lose. We didn't lose. <laughs> but, but, but the, the larger point is, I investigated. I thought about what it was, and I made lists. I was like, okay, here are the things we could do differently. And what I realized is that there was nothing about our campaign that I could do differently, but there are systemic challenges. One is that the fight is not fair, and therefore I started an organization to fix that problem. The other is that the, the people aren't being counted, and so I'm starting an organization to tackle that. I'm not saying go home and start a new company, because all y'all will do that. <laughs> but what I am saying, and what I'm saying to you as a student, is figure, do the hard work of investigating how much is you, but do not make it all about you. Because sometimes the mistake's not yours, you just are the manifestation of everybody else's suckery. Okay? And there's a, there's a lot of suckery there out is. there. There's, that's and remember, uh, facts. And remember to purchase Lead from the Outside, available at your local bookstore. So, uh, two years ago, Stacey Abrams spoke in New York. Um, and one of the things that struck me about her is that she was there really, she spoke in the afternoon, she was there in the morning. She, had, she was sitting in the front row, she opened a notebook, she took copious notes, and she, you really showed up for us. Um, you showed up for us early, um, and you have just this sense of presence and loyalty and commitment, and you fight for people who do not have a voice. Um, and you do that with such humility and brilliance and integrity, um, and you really fight, you fight for justice. And at the same time, you have this authenticity that is palpable. And so I just want to say to you, no matter what you do, Senate or President, <clears throat> President, um, that I will and we will follow you wherever you want to go, and we will fight alongside you as long as it takes to get quality in this country.